Hey, what's up guys? My name is Eterno and welcome back to my OpenGL series. So, we've done blending, we've done textures, we've done vertex arrays, index buffers, vertex buffers. We've done all of this stuff, we've got stuff rendering on our screen. But we haven't actually even touched on one of the biggest parts of graphics programming. Maths. Or math, if you're from the US. So what is maths? Why do we use it? Like, how can we use it? And why do we even need it? So maths in general is used in pretty much every area of graphics programming and as this series continues and we start dealing with things we'll actually have to start implementing our own kind of algorithms that involve maths and doing calculations and all of that. I'm fairly sure that anyone who is new to OpenGL or new to graphics programming probably has an idea in their head that maths is going to be required and we are going to start diving into those topics but today we're just going to kind of talk about how maths is used in general and get started with a maths library and actually write some code that does something. So maths, the, w when I talk about maths in graphics programming, I'm really talking about two different kind of areas of maths or two different concepts that we have, matrices and vectors. Now matrices, a matrix is essentially an array of numbers with, that we can kind of manipulate by multiplying or we can set up in various ways, right? It is literally an array of numbers and when we multiply those numbers by something else, we get a new set of numbers. And those calculations can be useful for things like positioning objects in a 3D world. On the flip side, vectors, there are two types of vectors that we deal with in graphics programming. And I know because I get a lot of comments about this all the time, so we are going to take the time to quickly talk about them. There's directional vectors and there's positional vectors, right? So a vector can refer to something that you're probably used to if you've done something like engineering maths or high school maths or depending on different countries, how they teach it and all, that and, and all of that. But essentially a vector is traditionally seen as like a direction and a magnitude or a length, right? So you're probably, if, you, if you're coming from actual maths, you're probably used to hearing about a vector as like, you know, pointing somewhere, like a literal direction. Um, Vectors in graphics programming can be that, but they can also be just positions in either a 2D, 3D, or 4D space, right? So, for example, I could have a vector that's like 200, 100, and what that means is that it's a point on my screen that's like 200 pixels in from the left and 100 pixels up from the bottom. That is also a vector. So, you should definitely get used to that terminology. Um, Vectors and matrices are used a lot, but the I would say probably the most common usage and the most important usage, especially when you're just beginning, is for transformation. So we are definitely going to talk about this in much more detail with like diagrams and all of that stuff in the future. But the transform a transformation is essentially a way that we can get our vertex buffer with all of its points and all of the vertices into some kind of form that we see on our screen. The reason that we need transformation is for a number of reasons. First of all, let's just say we have a massive 3D world and we have a ball, right? We need to position that ball somewhere in the 3D world. What if we have a camera moving around? Maybe it's orbiting around the ball, right? The way that that works is that, well, there's no such thing as a camera, really. What we need to do really is just move the world and the ball around. So we change the position of the world and the ball and that kind of creates the illusion of a camera circling or orbiting our, our subject. We might want to also like position vertices in a way that isn't just a translation. It might be something like scale or we want to rotate things. All of that stuff requires maths to actually accomplish. And the reason that we, if I mean, if we launch the thing that we have right now, you can see that we don't really have like a 3D world or anything. We have this channel logo. However, the aspect ratio is completely wrong because by default, OpenGL gives us a projection matrix of negative one to one, which kind of assumes that the window is actually square. Our window is not square. It's 640 by 480 pixels, which means it has a four to three aspect ratio, four three, right? Not one to one. So even for something as trivial as this, we also need a transformation. We need to actually make our geometry not be as if our window was square we need to actually kind of change this, this quad that we're drawing here and applying the texture to it so that it's the right aspect ratio to fit our monitor even the, or our window. Even that requires a transformation. So a lot of transformations happening. Anyway, 
I could sit here talking all day about mats and how it's used. You will see as this series continues. Let's just jump into it and let's use a maps library and let's just fix for now this kind of transformation issue we have with the Chernet logo. So I'm going to be using a maps library that's free. It's called GLM. You can find this, I'll leave the link in the description below. This is specifically an OpenGL mathematics library. It doesn't really matter what maps library you use as long as it's something that works and contains all the features we need. Typically, if I was running my own engine, I'd probably write my own maths library. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, OpenGL, the, the reason this is this, this one's good is because it's OpenGL specific, uh, which means that, like, for example, the matrices are column major ordering. So the way that the actual matrix is laid out in memory is in a way that OpenGL kind of expects it to be and doesn't need to do any kind of transformation or, well, as it's called, transpo uh, transposition, transposing to actually convert it into the right format. If I was using a math, if I had an engine with a lot of different graphics APIs, I'd probably opt for a row major ordering because that can be a little bit more friendly for CPU side multiplication and all of that. Um, we're not gonna to talk too much about this. What I'm saying is if you don't like GLM or if you, if you wanna use a different library, feel free to. I'm just using GLM because it seems to be the standard kind of OpenGL maths library. And at this point I don't care because it works for what I need. So over here, I'm going to go to releases which is over here, and then download this latest release by just clicking on the zip file over here. And once I've got it downloaded inside the zip file, we have a GLM folder inside there. We have a bunch of different things. I really only care about this, the actual code, which is in the GLM folder. So I'm going to copy that GLM folder. I'm going to then go to the location of my OpenGL project and then under source vendor, I'm going to paste in that GLM source code. So GLM is a header only library, which means there are no CPP files. We don't need to compile it at all. As soon as we include it, it'll kind of get compiled like that. So we don't have to link against the library or kind of create a CPP file like we did with STB image. This stuff is really easy to use and let's just get right into it. So once I've got this pasted over here, one thing I will do is I'll right click on OpenGL, go to properties and under all configurations here in C, C++ general, I'm just going to add source slash vendor to my actual additional include directory so that I don't have to type vendor every time I want to include a file. So we kind of saw this, I guess, in the texture.cpp file. We included vendor stb image. We don't need to do that anymore. We can just do stb image like that and that should work fine because we've added that compiler include directory. I'm just gonna refresh my project over here. Now I do want to uh, include this, like all of these files in my actual solution in my project. I mean, they're not gonna get compiled anyway, but I still want them to come up with searches and all of that. So in other words, if I you know, press like control shift F and I want to search for like GLM or something, I want it to actually search all of my files. However, there is a file inside GTC, I think it is, or maybe it's in GTX. Yeah, there's this dummy.cpp file, which um, just says that it's a header only library and this is just for kind of CMake. Uh, if you scroll down, you'll see it actually does have a main function that will interfere with our main function. So let's just right click that file and hit exclude from project because we obviously don't want to compile that. Okay, cool. So anyway, we've got GLM up and running, really easy stuff. What I'm going to do now is actually use it inside my application.cpp file. The way that we're going to fix our issue with the channel logo is by using something called a projection matrix. Now a projection matrix is a way for us to actually tell our window how we want to map all of our different vertices to it. So we have this concept of having a vertex buffer filled with vertex positions. However, we need to obviously transform that into some kind of 2D plane because when we draw it on our, on our laptop screen or on our computer monitor, we need it to actually be drawn in a 2D way. So picture a 3D world, right? We have this mathematical representation of a 3D world, but we need to draw it on a 2D surface. So how does that how does the maths work for that, right? How do we go from having this 3D geometry to having a flat kind of 2D drawing? That is what a projection matrix is used for. And we'll definitely dive into the details and diagrams and all that stuff in a future video. But the way that we need to fix this problem is by basically telling all of our kind of vertex positions that make up that Cherno logo that, hey, the window that we're drawing onto isn't actually a square, it's four by three. So maybe do some maths to make that work. So if we go down here, the way that we're really going to do that is pretty simple. First of all, I'm going to include GLM over here by typing in GLM 
slash glm.hpp. And we actually need one more include, which I think is gc slash matrix transform. Okay, cool. So we've included two header files here. Now, if we scroll down, um, what I'm going to do here is where we actually start to create all of our uniforms, I'm going to create a, I'm going to create my projection matrix. So I'm going to call this glm mat4, that's the type, it's a four by four matrix. We're going to call it proj, and I want to set it equal to glm colon colon ortho. This is going to create something called an orthographic matrix. Now for the left and right, we just, I mean, for this left, right, bottom, top, we really just need to specify something that adheres to that four by three aspect ratio. So I'm going to use something like negative two for the left, positive two for the right, negative 1.5 for the bottom, and then positive 1.5 for the top. And we, for near and far, we can just specify something like minus one and one. We don't need to specify that, but we can. Okay. So if you multiply both of these numbers by two, you'll get four by three. That's essentially my reasoning here. I've just created something that has a distance of three units from the top to bottom of the window and four units from the left and right. So it's a four by three aspect ratio, which should fix all of our vertex positioning. Now, an orthographic matrix is just essentially a way to map all of our coordinates onto a 2D plane where objects that are further away do not actually get smaller. This is opposed to like a perspective projection, which is what we're kind of used to seeing if we take a photograph in real life, where objects that are further away are actually smaller. That's something that we use for 3D rendering. We're just interested in kind of 2D rendering here, so we don't need that, that functionality. Orthographic and perspective projection is a bit of a topic in itself. We'll definitely cover that and, com and compare the differences. So another reminder that this video is just an introduction to all of this. I just like to give a practical introduction so that we can actually get something on the screen and you can, you can tinker with the numbers and play around with it yourself. We will definitely dive into this stuff, probably beginning with like the next episodes and all of that stuff. Okay, so once I've got this projection, I need to use it in my shader because what I'm really trying to do, I could of course do the multiplication on the CPU side and actually just multiply all of these vertex positions by this matrix or specifically convert these into basically vector twos or vector fours and then do the multiplication with this matrix. However, I'm actually going to do that in the shader. So if I go to my basic.shader here, I'm going to add a uniform so that I can take in that matrix from the CPU into our shader. I'm going to call, I'm going to call it uniform uh, mat4, that's the type, u underscore mvp, which is going to be our model view projection matrix. Model view projection matrix. Now this specific part of it, we're just including a projection matrix, not a view matrix or a model matrix. I'm going to talk all about that lovely stuff in the future. And what I'm going to do with this matrix is just multiply my vertex positions with it. We're in the vertex shader. This runs once per vertex. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this vertex position that comes in from our vertex buffer and just multiply it with our projection matrix. That's going to move it into the appropriate space based on that orthographic matrix that we've actually provided. So back in our source code over here, we now need a way to actually set that uniform. So we have a set uniform for F, which is fine for a vector four, but what we really need is something that is a set uniform mat matrix for F or just map for F, I'll call it. And this is going to be called, well, it's going to, the, the, the uniform is called U underscore MVP. And then the value that I want to set is just this GLM matrix. So I'll just pass in proj. That's the function that we now need to create. So if we go into our shader class over here, I'm going to add that function, set uniform mat for F. I'll leave this const string name and then I'll just add a const glm mat for matrix, just like that. And we'll scroll up to the top and include glm slash glm.hpp like that. Okay, pretty cool. So back in our C++ file for our shader, we're going to just add that function definition here. I'll just use visual, visual assist to get the signature. And now this is going to be GL uniform mat 4FV. The V kind of, oh, it's actually matrix 4FV. The V kind of just means that we're passing in an array. So we need to pass in a float array at this point. Uh, so we can provide the uniform location as we do with all of our other set uniform functions. We're taking the name here. The count is how many matrices we're providing. We're providing just one matrix. Do we need to transpose the matrix? If your matrix was a row major, 
matrix, which means that the way that it's laid out in memory is essentially to buy just by the rows, not by the columns like GLM does. You need to transpose it either yourself or you can pass in true here. We don't need to transpose it because we're using GLM, which stores its matrix like elements in column major, which is what OpenGL expects. So we can pass in GL false over here. And the value is essentially a pointer to that float array. So what we can do here is just pass in the memory address of matrix. And then this basically just says column zero and element zero inside column zero. So that's it. That's a, the way the GLM stores it is as an array, but we can use these index operators to actually get the location of the first element. And then the rest will be stored sequentially in memory. So there we go. Let's run this with the GL call. And that's really all we need to do. So now back in application, we set the uniform as we do over here, just once, once is enough. We can set it every frame if we want to, like we do with color, but since it's not changing, there's no need for us to do that. If we hit F5 now, hopefully this will work. And you can see that we get something that's a lot smaller, but it is in fact the right aspect ratio. And for comparison, if we go over here, maybe we change the orthographic matrix to be four, four and three, three. We're still keeping that four, three aspect ratio, but we've made it essentially twice as big our actual geometry should be a lot smaller and you can see we have created a smaller journal logo. So I might revert back to the other one because this is a bit too small, but that's essentially how it works. By specifying these four positions, we're basically specifying the four kind of boundaries of our window. So left is negative two. If we try and draw a vertex position at negative two, in fact, let's just for fun, move one of these to negative two. It might be hard to see because we're drawing a texture and not a color and the texture is alpha. But if we draw this to, if we were to change this to negative two, it would be at the very, very left edge of our actual window. I'll keep it, I'll put it back to 0 0.5. And then that's the way that this works. So that's the left edge, that's the right edge, that's the bottom edge, that's the top edge. And then this is the near and far plane, which means if we try and render something that's kind of outside this, it will get culled. Anyway, I'm almost confusing myself by talking about all of this because we really need to spend like 20 minutes on each of these concepts, which we will do in the following episodes. But I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of introduction to maths in OpenGL. I can just see like another 10 to 20 episodes just on this topic alone. Let me know what made sense, what didn't make sense, what you wanna see more of. I'm gonna probably put together some presentations like I did with the blending video because that's really gonna help me explain this stuff. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. If you want to support this series, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the channel and get, get all these videos early and get to talk about this stuff in a private kind of Discord server and get access to a monthly hangout where we talk about the direction of these series and what you want to see and life and all that stuff. And it really does help support this series. So as always, huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters for making this possible. I will see you guys next time with a lot more maths. Goodbye. Thank you.